So let's go ahead and dive in. First, a little bit of housekeeping here. So you've probably noticed your line is muted, but you can use chat if you want to um, share something interesting that you're hearing about today's presentation, or if you have like a technical question, um, you can ping me there and I will take a look. Uh, but the best place to add your questions about the content today is in the Q&A section. I'm also going to enable so that uh, everyone can see the questions that have been asked. And if you like a question that's been asked, you can upvote it. And then we'll prioritize the most uh, upvoted questions first to ask during our Q&A session at the end. And if you missed anything today, no sweat. You are going to get an email with this presentation, recording, and links so you can go back rewatch anything that you might have missed and also maybe share it with a colleague. Okay, with that out of the way, a little bit about TechSoup. Um, and if this is your first time attending a webinar from TechSoup, welcome, it's great to have you here. Um, so TechSoup equips change makers with transformative technology solutions and skills that they need to improve lives globally and locally. So what that looks like and what many people know TechSoup for um, is offering discounts on the tools they use, software, hardware, things like that. But we do a whole lot more than just provide discounts. We also provide support, training, community, and much more. And we help over 1 million nonprofits and more than 200 countries and territories around the world. Um, so you can find out more about TechSoup by heading over to techsoup.org. And in the post event email, we'll also include some really great resources to learn more about what TechSoup can do for your nonprofit. And with that, we're getting to uh, the most exciting part of our presentation, introducing our presenters today. So once again, I'm Nicole Jones from TechSoup. I'll be your host moderating, making sure everyone's nice and cozy here today. Um, and on today's webinar, we have our speakers and partners at TAP Network. And at TechSoup, we rely on TAP for marketing support, such as email marketing, landing page development, and so much more. And what we love about them is that they work with a lot of mission-driven organizations and provide the digital marketing and social media services needed to deliver compelling content at the right time, on the right channels, and to the right audience. And that's why they are so poised to talk about today's topic about how to boost your end of year fundraising. So with that, take it away, TAP team. Great. Hi, folks. Um, my name is Joe Giovanni. I'm one of the co-founders of TAP Network. And today we're going to talk to you about year-end fundraising, especially how to work through the challenges as, as we learn the pivot with the, uh, with the coronavirus and, and, and the year-end fundraising ahead. The best way we could really do that through multiple channels. So we'll walk you through some examples today and some best practices. Hi, everybody. My name is Whit Godden. I'm the Director of Strategic Marketing over here at Top Network. Um, I work closely with Joe and Kyle to develop the strategic roadmaps for our clients, as well as um, preparing and managing all of the educational content that we uh, push out through uh, TechSoup, as well as the services. So really excited to get through the um, the deck today and, and get you guys geared up for the end of the year. But before we head, head off on that, um, I'm going to have Joe go ahead and Give a little introduction to our agency. Sure, TAP Network, we're a marketing and technology firm. We work primarily with the nonprofits in the social space. We develop websites and apps and do digital marketing for nonprofits all over the world, including uh, you know, through our partnership with TechSoup. So we're here to help out today. If you have any specific questions, you can uh, reach us. We'll have our email addresses at, at the end of this uh, presentation, and you can go right through TechSoup, uh, through the digital marketing or website services pages. So uh, looking forward to getting started, and I'll turn it over to Wit, and um, we'll get going. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, so um, what we're going to cover today, uh, we've got sort of six secrets, I guess, or six um, six ways that you guys can really get your year-end fundraising uh, off to the good start and really make sure that you guys have all of the pieces in place to make sure that you end the year 2020, which I know we've all had a our own personal, uh, uh, you know, sort of feelings about that, uh, but we're hoping to end it really, really well, really strong for the nonprofits here. So first we're gonna discover and talk through sort of how to develop your last minute year end fundraising strategy. And then we're gonna cover how you guys can quickly boost donations directly on your site. 
And we'll move through to increasing your social media fundraising efforts. And then talk a little bit about how email drip campaigns are sort of how they function in general, and then how you can utilize those and leverage those to target your corporate funders. Um, the, the fifth item that we'll talk about is the opportunity to drive donations through your virtual year end events online. And lastly, and of course, most importantly, is how do you measure the effectiveness of your campaign? Um, so we'll, be, we'll highlight some key metrics that you guys should be tracking throughout that and able to report uh, so you can build year over year um, and, and have a good baseline um, and a benchmark for your own organization as well as comparing to other sectors. But before we get started, I'm sure we're all aware, um, but it's, it's always nice to just kind of start with a little bit of why year-end fundraising matters. So um, we put together some really unique and interesting uh, metrics here for you guys to take a look at and we can kind of discuss to get our heads wrapped around really what the importance is and how, how vital year-end fundraising is to nonprofits. So um, to start off, you know, there was a, a survey that was sent out through CCS um, where there was an expected decline in fundraising, 72% of survey respondents said that they expected to decline in, in fundraising during the rest of 2020, particularly in response to you know, COVID-19. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what that means in relationship to the standard expectations of your year end fundraising, as well as how you can continue to um, utilize and leverage this time of year to hopefully combat that um, expected decline. So 31% of all annual giving actually occurs within the month of December. And of all of the, of all the giving that happens in, throughout the end of year, 12% of year end giving happens on the last three days of the year. So you're looking at the 28th, the 29th, the 30th and the 31st. So it may feel like it's just, it's, it's just around the corner, but we've got some time uh, we've got some time to get you guys situated and, and prepared for that sort of big last chunk there. Um, <clears throat> as well as 28% said that they raised 26 to 50% of their annual funds from their year end ask. That's a giant portion of your, your um, working budget. And then a really helpful metric and, and insight to take, a, uh, take note of is that nearly 60% uh, said that it takes between one to three donor touches. So that's each time your donor um, has an interaction with your organization for their year end campaign in order for them to, to donate. And lastly, I found this really interesting that your volunteers are twice as likely to donate. So we'll talk about what that means um, in some of the slides coming down, but let's just sort of let these numbers sink in as far as importance and relevance to the conversation as we move forward here. So I'm going to hand it over to Joe to sort of discuss how we can develop our last minute year end fundraising strategy. Great. Thanks, Whit. Yeah, so the most important piece here is really getting the strategy together. It's, it's that ready, aim, shoot approach where if you spend the time up front, uh, it's going to pay off uh, at the end as, as you get towards the end of the, uh, the year. So three main things we really need to focus on, I think, when you're looking at um, your strategy is one is, is segmentation, looking at the lowest hanging fruit. Number, the second piece is scripts and messaging. And then third, like an omni-channel approach to, um, to, to your whole campaign and planning that out. So getting to the segmentation part, um, there's really four main things you should focus on when you're looking at your list and prioritizing your contacts. Number one, create a list of your LYBNTs. That's gave last year, but not this year and sort accordingly to dollar range so you can prioritize contacts with the largest donors. You're gonna to wanna to remind these folks of the generous past support, thank them, of, that, of what they did and let them know that you still got time to renew and make a difference this year. And then number two, make sure to evaluate your, your funders or your potential base based on cumulative annual giving. So a $100 a month donor is not a $100 donor, they're basically a $1,200 donor, and be able to go back, look at the cumulative effect of these donors and, and sort them accordingly with the lowest hanging fruit are the, are the folks that, that are doing that because you want them to continue that um, reciprocal giving each, each month and each year. And then three, don't overlook your peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers. 
who bring in significant gift totals. And that could be, you know, through your Facebook pages and, and things of that nature. Look, look through your social channels, look through your apps and, and really identify from a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising perspective who those folks are, because you want to go out to reach them directly. You might want to train them or give them some more guidance on the year-end appeal, what that is, and make sure that they have the tools to do so. And you know whether that's a toolkit or one-on-one -on -one training, but activate those folks. And then finally, don't forget your volunteers. Volunteers are more than twice as likely to give as other members uh, within a nonprofit. And often we overlook them. So thank them for their, for their volunteering and ask them for, you know, to support your year-end giving. So these four things are quick and easy ways to, to get started and really look at the, at the, best, at the, um, at the best funding opportunities and, and segments to go after. On the next slide, what we're really looking at here is, is kind of the messaging now, because you have to plan ahead uh, for these donors and, and what are you gonna, how are you gonna contact them, especially the LAPS donors. So create a script for your team or your volunteers to use when you're reaching out. And if you can create that script and A-B test it, have a different um, scripts and try and try them over the first few days, see what's working best, what's resonating. You might have different scripts for different types of donors, but when calling on those lapsed donors, um, try to test, test that out in the beginning and then you'll be, and then go full stream when you see what's working best. And if you're not able to call them, Plan on sending them a miss you letter or, or an email. And again, A, B test, create different subject lines, different bodies to copy, see what's working, um, whether it's to get them to donate directly on that email, or if you're just trying to get them on the phone, knowing that your development folks can close them. So plan ahead and first, you know, go after those laps donors as well. For the next slide, what we really wanna, um, focus on here is that that email series. How do we take that to the next level? So if you think about it, if 10% of gifts arrive in the last 72 hours of the year, it's best to plan ahead and at least five email touches in December or leading up to, to that piece. Um, and that can even be one or two blog posts. And then your subject lines, they really shouldn't be an, an afterthought. 33% of email recipients open emails based on the subject lines. So Again, A, B, test those. You can Google around, look what's working best, but make sure you get that, that open rate going on the emails. And then we have to look through click-through rate, and that's when you look at the body of the emails to see if people are clicking through, are they donating, are they um, asking for more information? And those things add up. And of course, personalize your emails. Don't do it just a, a generic email blast. You can improve your click rate by 14% and above if, if they're personalized. Um, and then send fundraising emails more than just once. You know, you want to build, build it up, thank people. That could be the first email. Um, recognize them for their contribution. You want to show impact and then, you know, have that ask for, for the fundraising. Um, but don't, if, if you send it just once, you might not get a response, but you know, we, the, the data shows out there that it takes up to five to six emails to get folks to convert. So choose your messaging wisely. And then finally, on the next slide, what we're talking about here is, is branching out. You know, we know that reaching out by phone in person is hard because of COVID and, and email are direct ways to, to reach out. But if you take an omni-channel approach, meaning you know, social media, um, it could be direct mail. Um, all different ways of, of reaching folks on your website, writing blogs. But if you could coordinate all that, and what a lot of nonprofits um, fail to do is, is mapping out that calendar for, these, for that last 90 days towards the end of the year. And you still have time to do it. But map out your different segments, who you're going after, lap donors, volunteers, corporate funders. You know, you know what your segments are. And then map out the information that they're going to need to make that decision to donate. Some might want to, you know, work on the, the heartstrings of, of what you're doing and how you're supporting the community. And those folks will donate one way. The other way could just be simply about the impact, the financial impact. Some folks are donating because of the tax write-off. You know, generally what, what each target audience um, 
is going to do to to fund you know to to give those funds. So map out what that messaging will be into a calendar, then execute against it. Blogs, email, social media, and if you could stick to your plan, you'll have a much better chance of of reaching your goals. Great, thanks so much, Joe. So our, our next secret here is how to quickly boost donations directly on your website. So as, as Nicole pointed out um, earlier, she, as she mentioned, uh, TAP, we, we manage a lot of nonprofit websites. Um, some of us even in our own personal time. And the example that I have here is uh, actually an organization that's near and dear to my heart, which is the Philadelphia Gay Men's Chorus, who I've worked with uh, for the last two years. But some of those key elements that are gonna help um, drive donations directly to your site is ensuring that you have mobile capacity, mobile responsiveness, and that giving your donations through a mobile platform is easy um, and, and simple to do. You know, we're more and more depending on smartphones and tablets as the main access of, uh, of communication from our member bases. So ensuring that your website, as well as your donation widgets and your donation um, plugins, ensuring that those are mobile friendly is, is key and important. The, the second sort of secret here is to make sure that you grab a pe people's attention. Uh, use compelling or, um, or thoughtful images. You know, for, for this instance, I think it's really wonderful how we, we showcase the entire member of the organization right here and, and everyone sort of smiling and, and really being proud of what we do. Uh, from a year-to-year -year basis. So grabbing people's attention, I think, is, a, is an important part to compel people to continue to understand and learn what your organization does and why it's important for you to make a donation. Um, if you're using any third-party platforms, like in this case, we've used a plugin here um, or a widget, make sure you're fully branding your donation platforms. Um, we want to ensure that the audiences and that our visitors and our member bases feel comfortable and they know exactly who they're giving to. You know, if you take them to a generic, bland uh, platform that has no branding on it whatsoever, you're quick to lose that opportunity to, to snag that last minute donation or that year end donation. Um, so ensure that there's this sort of uniform brand identity across all of your website and any donation platforms. And lastly, keep it simple, right? We wanna make it easy to find on your website, make sure your donate button is at the top of your navigation bar? Um, is it in the footer as well? Um, do you have a slider on your homepage that clearly calls out your year-end fundraising campaign? So make it easy to find on your site. And then also don't make it challenging to actually complete a donation. Nothing is more frustrating than when you wanna go and do something good and someone makes it difficult for you to do a good deed. And you've gotta add your first name, your last name, your email, your birthday, your all these different form fields just keep it simple, keep it minimal, uh, and make it easy for them from a user experience perspective to fulfill that, that incentive, to fulfill that obligation that they've now arrived to after being sort of compelled to make a donation for you all to succeed your year-end fundraising goals. A couple other components that are gonna help quickly boost your donations directly through your website is, as you saw on the last page there, is, is using tier donation levels. A couple reasons why this is helpful. If you leave an open-ended question, how much money are you gonna give? It might cause people to feel like, oh, I don't know, they're gonna kind of stagger or stutter their way through making that decision. But if you say, hey, give $10, give $50, it's much more easy um, for them to align with that potential financial giving. Um, secondly, you know, you have the opportunity to further outline what those individual tier donations may, um, may afford your nonprofit organization. So there may actually be a, an additional storyline that you could drive through that particular tier donation level that might speak to a specific person. If it's, um, if you guys were, if your organization deals with, um, you know, homelessness, it may be $50 will allow us to uh, find shelter for one family for the weekend over Thanksgiving. You know, if you can identify what that incentive is and outline that in those tier donation levels, there's sort of a double whammy there where you're kind of guiding them through and not making them have to make any guesswork as well as providing value around that donation level. Um, another missed opportunity that sometimes happens is 
ensuring you have that toggle switch on through for your year end fundraising campaign sites and just giving that person the opportunity to monthly give you know this is an opportunity if they haven't given to your organization before you captured them at the end of the year during peak fundraising peak giving season uh, you may have this uh, opportunity to sort of bring them in as a um as a dynamic donor as we call it at pgmc or an ongoing donor um, so ensure you have that that turned on uh, if, if your platform allows it Another way that's helpful is to add social proof. Nothing makes us as humans more compelled to do something than if someone showed us that someone else is doing it better than us or more than us, right? Um, so as you can see here, we've got a, we actually have a leaderboard listed on our donation platform that allows our, our actual member base as well as our donor base to identify who's doing really well, how much is the average donation, what is, who is bringing how much money in. And it just, it's a healthy competition, right? It's a healthy way to say other people are doing this. I want to join this movement. I see that this is a genuine and, and somewhat successful uh, campaign. So I want to help. I want to help move that along. And then leveraging at the moment. So when I say that, I mean, once someone has completed their donation, give them the opportunity to join your mailing list if they're not already part of your mailing list. Use that as an opportunity to bring them into your, um, your member base in a more um, efficient and uh, constructive manner. You give them the opportunity or the option to give you a shout out on social media. Um, so is there a way at that end of that donation process for them to say, hey, I just donated to this organization. Would you, I say you should do it as well or you know, bring that social proof there. Um, provide an opportunity to increase your initial donation option. Uh, so if someone donated $15, maybe say, hey, if you add $5 onto your donation, we'll be able to complete X, Y, and Z. Um, and sort of creating that second option to potentially increase your donation. And always ensuring that as we talk, as uh, Joe mentioned before, personalization, personalization, we wanna feel, we wanna make sure that our audiences and our donorship feel like they're seen as a one-to-one -one relationship. So ensuring that you have personalized email receipts, not only for the sake of saying thank you, but also so they have a record for their, um, any tax deductible um, uh, write-offs that they're gonna be planning to do uh, as we approach tax season in 2021. Um, so for the third uh, sort of secret here, we're, we're gonna kind of walk through how you can increase your social media fundraising. We got a couple key ideas and a couple key strategies that we've used here in-house at TAP Network uh, that we hope we can share with you that are gonna help elevate and leverage your social media platforms and bring that into your overall end of year fundraising strategy. So the first thing that you wanna make sure is choosing your platforms intentionally. And when I say platform, for those of you who may not be familiar with that terminology, I'm talking about the actual social media channels, whether or not that's Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn. And in some cases you may be using Snapchat or TikTok. Um, there's a lot of different options out there, but ensure that you're really understanding and the intention behind not only the messaging for your year-end fundraising, but also the demographics and the overall functionality of those platforms. For instance, Facebook has a, a way for you to do actual on Facebook fundraising, whereas you know Twitter doesn't. So are you gonna be directing people to a, a landing page through Twitter versus running the online fundraising campaign through a direct Facebook page. Um, LinkedIn has a, a much more professional a more prospe professional audience. So you may be looking more toward your corporate and or business sponsorship relationships for your end fundraising through the messaging that you're posting through um, your uh, LinkedIn account. But at the end of the day, uh, the second part of this that's going to be super crucial and super helpful and take a weight off of a lot of the shoulders of people who want to help you uh, fundraise through your year-end year uh, goals is to make your graphics and other materials accessible and or easily shared. Um, so for instance, with the Game Men's Chorus, we create an entire press kit that we hand out to all of our board members and our donor bases with pre-written emails, uh, pre-written Facebook posts, all of the graphics that are available for you to put on your 
um, Facebook uh, header profile, or you can update your Twitter profile or an Instagram story template. So make those materials very accessible. You can even have them available as downloads on your actual giving page. I even included this. This is an organization, the American Heart Association. They did a walk, uh, their national um, heart walk. And they actually had within their ap application, they had pre-written messages that you could automatically customize and then link up directly to your Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram and post through there. So making that ease of sharing and help amplifying the work that you're already doing is just a small percent extra lift on your end where you can get a lot of return. And in the same vein, I, I actually love this meme. I'm sorry, I, have, I like chuckled when I found it. Um, but like challenge your donor base to fundraise on your behalf. You know, you've created these existing relationships. Um, look at the opportunity of doing you know, viral challenge videos. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the ALS ice bucket challenge. Um, you may have a, 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 um, a bunch of brand ambassadors already uh, available to you that you can sort of ask to go out through their social networks and their social followings and incentivize them to help spread the word uh, of your organization on their own profiles with nonprofit merch or maybe experiences. Um, there's also the opportunity to create and, and roll out peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaigns where you invite your supporters to make a page in conjunction with your own uh, fundraising page, similar to the way that a lot of the, the walks, the national walks work, as well as crowdfunding. Um, where you you encourage them to and you encourage your supporters to share your landing page on their social networks. That's very similar to the the way in which uh, the uh, Philadelphia Gamers Chorus is running their campaign. You know we're, we're identifying that. So hopefully you're you're pulling a, a couple great ideas on how you can integrate your social media into your fundraising and leveraging your existing audiences and find new audiences to bring into the fold and continue to sort of exponentially increase your year-end fundraising efforts. Great, thanks Whit. Um, the next thing we wanna go into is leveraging email drip campaigns to target your, your corporate funders. So we'll go through some examples here on, on the best way to do that. Um, first we'll go, next slide, we'll, we'll give you a quick definition of what is an email drip campaign? It's a series of pre-written emails that are automatically sent to the prospect over a period of time based on criteria determined by the sender. Sounds complicated, it is a little complicated, but it, but it really works when you, once you get the hang of it. And in essence, it's, it's marketing automation, if, if we wanna call it by anything else. It's, it's personalization and automation coming together to really help drive your, uh, drive your prospects to become aware of what you're doing and ultimately to, to begin donating or at least trigger to your development team, it's time to make that phone call, they're, they're ready to donate. So we'll go through a few examples and three different types of prospects um, that, that we can actually target and, and give you some examples on the next slide. So three types of um, funders here. The, the first one is these are prospects. This is you create a target list. You might have four or five corporate partners within your, your city or your community, a couple banks, pharmaceutical company, but there might be a few others, or there might be some more grantees you wanna go after. So you kinda of wanna to put together a prospect list that you definitely wanna go and, and target. And there's a couple of ways to do that. If you have their email addresses and you've already spoken to them, that, that will help go a long way. Number two is your current supporters. You're gonna have different messaging for folks who are already um, funding your organization. And then number three, um, that's they're the LAP supporters. They're people who formerly supported and, and now they're inactive. So we'll usually when we work with our clients, we'll look at these three types of um, supporters and create a, a direct marketing campaign that's email drip oriented to, uh, to get them down the path. So for the first one, these, these, are, these are your prospects. So you're at the beginning stage of the relationship. You're still trying to capture someone's attention and get them interested. This is the awareness stage where you wanna make your most memorable impression while providing education about your organization. It's almost as like you're, you're setting them up for a first date. You wanna put your best foot forward, create engaging messaging, creative design, 
could be a mix of you know impact data and some and photography that really helps um, connect with that audience. And your goal is to entice them to really learn about more about your organization. You're not going to be able to get them to fundraise right away. You could have that call to action buried in that email, but more or less, you, you want them to request more information um, so you could take them down that path. And then next campaign, these are nurturing email drip campaigns. Um, these are your current supporters. You've taken things a little farther at this stage. You converted this audience, but now you want to keep them. Nobody wants to keep swiping on nonprofit Tinder every time someone puts up a please donate ad uh, for the nonprofit. With a nurture drip campaign, it's just that what the word says, you nurture relationship, you start it. This includes updating your donors or your volunteers on what's happening, delivering relevant, useful content, thanking them for their support, presenting additional opportunities to get involved, inviting them to become a recurring donor if they've just given one time gift. And with every message you send, tugging on those heartstrings to get them emotionally interested. And then finally, these are your, uh, these are the laps folks that we, we kind of touched on before. So maybe you got dumped, it happens, but maybe in spite of your best efforts, some of your donors, they just ghosted you. And maybe life's hardships got in the way for some. We know there's just so many challenges now with, with the pandemic. They had to turn their attention to other matters and they drifted away. These are people you're trying to reach with a re-engagement strategy. With this campaign, you wanna provide a very soft sell. It's more of a, hey member, remember us, what a beautiful relationship we had. Uh, we're still here doing things and helping people. And your goal is simple. Let's get these people back on board, but you wanna woo them, not, not really blast them. Which takes us to the next slide, which is really about how, how do we put this on paper? Um, so what we do for our clients is we'll look at these different audiences, whether it's volunteers, large corporate funders, individual donors, and, and map out what this email drip campaign is. And it's really almost an algorithm, a decision diagram. So it could be, you know, you have your request for sponsorship, they say yes, or they say no, or you wait two days, and then you have, a, you have another email that comes out. And you kind of map out the, the emails that you're going to use to get them to the right-hand side of the slide um, to get them to donate. And once they do, you thank them or you schedule a call or you continue sharing information about your impact. Um, we use HubSpot with a lot of clients. So if they've opened a lot of emails and they've come to the website to, to look at your annual report or to read blogs, we'll, we'll assign, um, we will assign triggers to that so you could lead score them. So if we know someone accumulated um, per 10 points per se because they did all these different actions, that will trigger a development officer at the organization to make a phone call that, to that person. We know they're super interested. They put in a ton of time reading all this information and, it's, and you know they're on the website right now or they've just read something, call them. Um, so there's all different ways to set these up, whether you have a, a, a nice robust platform like a HubSpot or you're just using constant contact or, or another email system, we can still put these automated programs into play. So you could really do this work in your sleep, basically, if you put the time in up front. So when you get to make that phone call, these folks are already down the path, they're educated, they're involved, they're engaged, and, and they're ready to, uh, to donate. And the other piece you really wanna focus on is virtual events uh, online at, at the end of the year. We know that we can't have these big events and galas and everybody's been scrambling on how to have these big events to raise money. The good news about all this is if you have a huge live event and you haven't put all the money into it, um, you can save money this year by, by not having to do all that and, and save time and resources and still come close to your, your fundraising goal, even though it's not a live event, you can do it virtually. So we'll look at a few ways some organizations have done that to pivot this year and, uh, and, and still make a nice dent towards their fundraising goal. In this case, uh, one of our clients, Increasing Hope, we launched the, uh, a virtual gala for them, which has entertainment. Um, 
We, there's a silent auction and we have a lot of social media integration. So this is leading up to the event. What's the marketing to get people to be part of the event? And when they, when they do register online, we will have these different elements in place to raise the money. And what's great about a virtual event is it doesn't just have to be that one evening. You could be raising money leading up to it during the actual event and, and post event as well, because you're creating um, content that, that is not just gonna live right then and there on that actual event. And then you can do a virtual run walk as well. We have many clients where we'll do peer to peer fundraising and, could, and, and sync that into Facebook or sync that into a walking app. Um, a virtual community where they can support each other. And again, social media integration is, is very important, um, especially for these year-end events. And a lot of these events, you can do them online on Facebook. You can have a Facebook event and, and promote it that way. You might not need to create this whole new web channel or website around your event. You can host and manage everything through Facebook, use Facebook Live. There's a lot of different opportunities and ways to get creative and you can reach more people uh, this way as well. Awesome, thanks Joe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so here's the, the, I think this is the big question that we all scratch our heads thinking really hard about. It's like, how do we measure the effectiveness of our campaigns? So we're gonna go through a couple different key pieces and ways you can kind of take a look in the rear view mirror and, uh, and make sure, hey, did I do everything perfectly? Unlikely, um, but how can we learn from the the opportunities that we saw, and also give ourselves a nice round of applause for the efforts and sort of the the goals that we were able to hit or closely reach. So the key metrics, I think, I just wanted to start off by sort of going through some key metrics to measure overall uh, for a year end year end uh, fundraising campaign. So. Let's take a look at your year in the past. So if you're if you're not a brand new organization, hopefully you've done a year-end fundraising campaign in the past. Taking a look at just the straight number donor growth is a great metric to look at. Um, not the dollar value, but the actual individual donors. Did you see a growth in that number year over year? And then, you know, also looking at the total number of donations received. So even if that one, like that one donor may have made multiple donations within that year-end fundraising campaign. So looking at just the raw number of total donations received is a nice healthy, helpful way to look and see, do we grow that year over year? <clears throat> um, another really helpful metric to just keep on track, right? And, and look past in, in the rear view mirror from the previous year or to sort of set your own personal benchmark is what was your average donation amount Right, so what was the average dollar amount that you received? So if it was $100, $100 total and 10 people donated, it would be $10 average donation amount. You also wanna see your donor retention rate. So how many donors returned from last year's year-end giving um, campaign? What percentage of them are also recurring donations? So if you've got 60, 100 people that are donating, what percentage of those people are actually set up to uh, give you guys a recurring donation on a month to month or annual basis? And then this is a little bit more challenging to, to figure out depending on how complicated and complex your, um, your full fundraising strategy is played out as far as if you're paying for paid advertising and all that kind of stuff. But it's helpful to be able to capture what the cost of your donor acquisition is. So you can identify, you know, if we know that it's a dollar for every donor, but the average donation is $5, you're looking at a $4 profit for every donor. So making sure you're staying within that, that range is helpful. So if you have the data points to be able to identify that, that's really, really helpful. And lastly, the conversion rate by channel. So um, it's helpful to take a look and see okay, if we reached 100 people on Facebook, but only four of them ended up donating, but we reached 100 people on LinkedIn and 50 people donated, that's a really helpful metric for us to take a look at and see which channel, remember we were talking a little bit before, um, identify and choose your platforms intentionally, identify which ones are converting better. You can even do this throughout your end of and year-end fundraising campaign, maybe for the first three weeks, what's, what are we getting as far as conversion rate on Facebook versus LinkedIn? Um, and then maybe you pivot your either your ad dollars or all of your content writing 
um, and your energy and your internal overhead resources to sort of meet those data points and say, hey, we're seeing a higher conversion rate on LinkedIn than we are on Facebook. So <clears throat> these are some of the, I think, key metrics for us to just have in our back pockets as we look, as we look and try to identify if, if we've had a, an effective campaign. Um, another way that's helpful to measure and, and just make sure that we're representing and understanding the data is putting those data points and, and visualizing them. Um, I've included here a link to the Google Data, Google Data Studio, which is a free tool for any of you guys uh, that, that are using any sort of Google platforms or um, if you are running search um, ads. I, take, I suggest you guys take a look at it. It's pretty beautiful. Um, and it really does allow you to cross-reference data points from multiple sources. Um, but putting your data into visualization is a really helpful way for you to sort of um, synthesize exactly how everything ran and or is running. Um, and it'll if this is your first year or if you're if this is your sixth year doing year end, it's it's just a nice way to be able to like take a step out of all the the cost per click and the cost per impression and and all of these different numbers and this the visualization I think is a nice healthy way for us to look at um, as we're as we're trying to measure the success. And then as I was mentioning on the last slide, comparing against benchmarks. So you know traditionally no better bench, benchmarks are better, no, none are better than your own benchmarks, right? So if you have those benchmarks available, nothing is better than beating your own record, right? So that should be where you start to look at and measure yourself against. But if you're, if you're a new organization, um, it may be helpful, or if you really wanna challenge yourself or just see how you, uh, how you sort of have played out amongst your peers, comparing against the performance of other organizations within your cause sector or within your cause vertical is a nice healthy way to just sort of see how you're doing across, across the, uh, the landscape and maybe provide a, an opportunity to say, wow, we did really, really well in our cause vertical or okay, it looks like we have some opportunities for our next year, year end or our, our overall annual fundraising strategies. And then lastly, um, calculating your ROI. Now this is a, this is a, I apologize, my cat has decided to get on my desk. Um, sorry about that. Uh, calculating your ROI. Uh, so, you know, measuring your year on campaigns by sort of taking the number of hours put into a project and divide it by the number of people who derive value from your campaigns. And now I left that term derive value from your campaigns because it may be monetary, but it also may be um, non-monetary. So some of your campaign efforts might be, how do we grow our donor database or, or our email base so that we can continue to find new people to provide um, donations along the way? So it doesn't know, it's not always gonna necessarily come down to a monetary structure, you know, from a year end fundraising perspective, nine times out of 10, that's probably the case. But your year end fundraising campaign may be just building out your existing email base or your volunteer base so that you know that you have the internal capacity or the communication outlets to survive the next six months and to bring people in and to continue to showcase and provide an impact uh, that your organization is, is hoping to reach. So I'm gonna hand it over to Joe to sort of walk us through our final takeaways and then uh, get us into some Q&A. Great, thanks Whit. Yeah, I just wanna go over five, um, five extra tips and takeaways that, that are really uh, helpful, I think, towards the end of the year. Number one is, is start early right now. Um, I, I really believe, you know, it's super difficult. We have, we're competing with the election chaos um, with the pandemic. And not just everyone's holiday plans um, and, and and big brand advertising campaigns. It's really hard to get a, to to get above the clutter, but if you plan appropriately and 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 take the time the next few days to really map out your year and plan, you know you you'll be off to a good start. And 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 the best the best defense is is a good offense. And then number two, uh, I wouldn't rely as much on direct mail this year. We know there's been a lot of um, challenges at the US post office and, and having mail delivery and, and, and some people even with, with, with the pandemic are, are not getting their mail as, as frequently as, as whether the post office delivers it or not, they might not be ready to read it. So you know, it, it's, it's just more important now to, to focus on digital if, if possible. And then three, we didn't really get into this as much today because we're looking at, at, at strategy, but throughout all these different um, you know, 
different different tools and techniques we spoke about today, whether it's email or, 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 or social media or your website, really look at uh, integrating video in, into, your, into your content. Um, what we've seen and the research shows that you'll get 12 times more folks to, uh, to watch a video than to read text. And you, know, you don't need to, to spend a, a ton of money to have a professional uh, video made. These could be um, people in the community that you're supporting. It could be user-generated video. It could be you know, a thank you to your funders. Uh, if, if you do have some type of small gala, even if it's video from last year, but try to, try to take the video that you can create. Your iPhone can work wonders. There's a lot of platforms out there that make the videos look, look really powerful and, and get them into your, into your appeals. And then Giving Tuesday, I know it's coming up about two weeks away, but there's still time and there's a ton of resources out there. So if you visit the Giving Tuesdays website, you, could, you can see their free online kit, super simple to use, pop your logo on it, um, and then maybe use that as the entree or a reason to reach out to some of these larger donors. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to get to raise Giving Tuesday money with folks who aren't aware of your, of your nonprofit. Um, but it gives a reason for the folks that are funding or considering to fund your nonprofit a, a, a milestone or, or a date to do so. And I, I would look at it that way and put your dollars towards the direct outreach under the auspice of Giving Tuesday as opposed to just spamming Giving Tuesday out there. Um, and then finally, don't ne neglect your follow up strategy. Um, you know, a lot of us, you know, from a business standpoint, if you've ever gone to or work the convention or a booth, you get leads. The same thing works for nonprofits. You know, people show interest, but if you don't follow up on these leads, these people who filled out your forms or who've attended past events, if you don't follow up, um, you're going to lose a lot of uh, a lot of um, opportunities to really to get them to donate. So fundraisers, they often spend the last few days of years. Actually, you know, anxiously tracking donations, and it's not just watching those numbers tick up. You have to go out and, and make those uh, make those calls. And sadly, according to research, around 50% of all donors, new and recurring, do not give again after the first donation. So you need a strong follow-up strategy to keep them engaged you know, throughout November, December, January, and, and beyond. And that goes back to you know, everything we talked about today is, is having that strategy. What is that follow-up strategy, whether it's your email drip campaign or your strategy on when to follow up with, with phone calls and, and making all these work together. So hope that was super helpful. And you know, there's a lot we covered today, but I think if you can take each one of these pieces and, and decide what best suits your, your nonprofit, you can really make a difference. So I'll, I'll turn it back to Whit. Yeah, so, um, you know, if you have any questions, if this has sparked any interest or, you know, I'm sure we'll get some great opportunity to speak to some of your specific questions in the Q&A, but don't, um, don't hesitate to reach out directly to the TechSoup experts. Uh, you can access them through TechSoup at tetnetwork.com, or you can also take a look at the services that um, are available as far as digital marketing assessments, website wellness assessments, which are free tools for you guys as well as getting in touch um, through consultations as well. So we invite you to, uh, to seek out some assistance if it seems like it's important and, and you're needing some. Um, and then other than that, I think we'll go to Nicole and get off to some Q&A. Yes, thank you guys so much. Lots of great things shared here today. And we have lots of great questions to follow it. So let's dive into our first question here. This one's from Monica. Monica says, our donor base is 65 plus um, as we're a nonprofit senior care community. So how can we increase donations to those who don't have access to digital content? That is a great question. Sure. I mean, there's, there's different ways to do that. You can, you can create flyers um, or, you know, direct mail type, type of pieces. There are going to be people who can't who can't access and you know you still need to, to use those channels um, most people can you know if, if they're not going to be on social media they could still go to your website for more for more information so i would still have links from those direct mail pieces to anywhere online to, to give more 
to give more um, information, but have something, the call to action on those print pieces would be to make that phone call or, or for them to you know, give them information and reach out. You're muted, Nicole. Thank you. Yes, print <laughs> is not entirely dead. I mean, um, while right. of course we're focused on being in the cloud, and there's um, a lot of benefits to digital marketing, as we as we know, um, thinking about accessibility is very important. So, and I, I would also that question. Yeah, <laughs> I would also say that there's probably um, you know when looking at like individual donors, uh, there may be family members. Um, that are involved with maybe the, the seniors who are in your home who may be willing to uh, help sort of drive online digital donations if the individual community members. And then also look at your nearby, um, your actual local nearby community, right? Are there um, restaurants or other community centers that you have partnerships with that you can sort of um, come together and collaborate who may have a larger digital platform um, and you guys can help spread each other's words um, and work um, across those, if there's you know limited access to those digital platforms, um, there may be some other creative ways to think outside of the box there. <clears throat> Thanks for that, Wit. Um, and just a reminder, now is the time to ask your questions. Head on over to Q&A. You can see all the questions that have been asked and upvote for your favorite ones and also drop in yours there. So let's move to this question. Uh, do you have information on how to set up monthly giving options and is it too late to set up for this year? That's a great question. Um, I'll take this, Joe, if, you, if that's cool. Um, I, it honestly depends on your the donation platform that you're using. So some donation platforms don't have a built-in capacity to collect monthly recurring donations. Um, some others do. So for instance, I'll give you an example of the one that the, that the case study that I shared, um, they use a platform called Give Lively. Um, Give Lively has the ability to collect monthly donations, whereas um, if we relied simply on the Squarespace uh, donation feature that only allows for single transaction donations. Um, so it really matters as it depends on what platform you're using. Um, as far as time frame, if your platform does it, you, it's, it's usually as simple as clicking a button. Uh, so it should be pretty much immediate. So take a look um, at what platform you're currently collecting um, donations on. I know changing might be a challenge, particularly in the middle of a fundraising period like this. Uh, so it may not be the best incentive. Maybe you sec set up a secondary um, fundraising sort of vertical that you can invite people to who have done a single donation um, that drives them into a monthly donorship uh, platform and gives affords that option. Um, so you're not missing out on the communications uh, opportunity through the year end giving platform, but then you're not mingling up a lot of potential donorship uh, and all of the plugins and widgets that may already exist on your current site. You can sort of implement that through a different com campaign strategy. Great. Thanks. Wait, anything you want to add to that, Joe, before next question? No, I think, I think we'll, we covered it very well. Thanks. Excellent. All right. Well, then our next question is from Lisa. Lisa says, we aren't able to segment our lists, frowny face, but um, <laughs> are there any other suggestions for email campaigns? So you, you were or were not able to. We aren't able to segment. Aren't them. able to segment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are there other suggestions for, for email campaigns if it's just really one list? So in, in some, sorry, Joe, do you have an, do you have an idea? Sorry. No. In some, in some instances, um, Lisa, depending on your, your email platform, you have the ability to actually go out and in your email campaigns themselves, request for more information, further information about that individual contact, and you can begin tagging um, or creating separate lists based off of the information and the criteria that they give you. So you can say, have you volunteered with our organization within the last six months? Yes or no. And you can start to craft that message through a genuine and authentic conversation um, and collect that data. So hopefully along the way, you'd have the ability to segment or identify individual contexts and how they engage with your donor base. If you're looking at something right away, um, I think to Joe's point earlier, just doing a blanket A-B test um, and, and you might just need to sort of start from there and see you know, what works as far as a subject line differentiator or a header image differentiator or 
changing out the call to action within the body of the email. Um, that might be the best way to get started if you're looking at a crunch time and you don't have the ability to necessarily um, invest in, you know, breaking up your, your email list. Great. Some sound advice there. So we also have another question from Lisa and I love this question and it comes up a lot. Um, she also <laughs> wants to know, well, she says first, we're an incredibly small team of two. So what top things should we be focusing on with our incredibly limited resources. Yeah, I think that 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 comes up often, and there's there's a lot of different opportunities here. And you have um, you know some some folks give around Thanksgiving as as a gratitude um, donation. You have Giving Tuesday, Cyber Week, um, the holidays. People give around the holidays, and then you have your annual appeal that that, that last week, and you know whether it's for taxes or or whatnot. So. I think the first thing to do is, is, is to pick one and, and really focus on it um, and have a central theme as well. You just don't want to have a Giving Tuesday campaign just for the sake of Giving Tuesday unless there's a theme around it. So if you don't have enough time to really build a Giving Tuesday campaign, you might want to pass off on that one and, and really have more of an annual type appeal. Um, and since you have a limited you know, resources, that, that's okay. I mean, you can create a single landing page or you could kind of re, reconvert your website a bit, just change the messaging. So it's, it's focused on that theme and that appeal and, and for that fundraising um, element. And that could be, you, you want to drive everyone to that homepage or to that landing page where they can donate. And that could be on Facebook as well. So small little lifts and all focusing on one theme, I think might be a way to get, to get past that. Great. Thanks for that, Joe. And uh, I see a question that came in and just, yes, a reminder, you will be getting a copy of this webinar, the replay, the slides, the links, all that good stuff will be bundled into one email and we will send that um, aiming for tomorrow morning, at least uh, Monday by the very, by the very latest rather, you will get that email with all that good stuff. So yes, um, you can go back and rewatch anything that you might have missed. All right, here's this question from Brandon. Brandon asks, are these email campaigns meant to be sent from an individual email address or through a system like Constant Contact, SurveyMonkey, or any other email provider? Uh, that's a great question. I'll, I'll take this one. Um, honestly, it depends on your relationship with that individual and where that's starting from. So for instance, you can create automated drip email campaigns through a CRM that comes from your personal email address. Um, those are technically called workflows, uh, not so much called drip campaigns, but they function in very much the similar way. Uh, they're not as markety and they're more as ensuring you're nurturing that relationship. So maybe you've moved the broad donorship conversation into a one-to-one -one conversation and a one-to-one -one relationship with somebody, and you're trying to nurture that singular lead, it would come across much more authentic if it came through your personal inbox um, and hooking up your personal inbox. For instance, we use HubSpot internally. You can develop workflows that automate and trigger individual um, individual personalized emails to take place if the recipient doesn't do a certain thing in a certain period of time. Um, so when you're thinking about a traditional trip drip campaign, yes, those are really more, think of those more as marketing um, from your, your organization as a whole and more of a workflow is more functioned within your internal inbox. They kind of are achieving similar goals through similar um, a strategic approach. Great. And I know we're at time here, but I think this <laughs> last question, if we can get to it real, real quick or relatively briefly, um, do you have advice for making fundraising on LinkedIn successful? That's a I great question. Yeah, you got it. Go for it. Yeah, I just have a, just an anecdote there is we, we see LinkedIn as LinkedIn is great for corporate funding. Um, mm -hmm. If you get corporate sponsors who are funding an initiative, they love that recognition on, on LinkedIn. And it's a great way to make it a bit competitive too, as, as other, let's say it's like I said before, there's a bunch of banks or whatever's in your community that, that are your main funders. As they start to see their, their competitors pop on LinkedIn as you're thanking them for, 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 their, um, for their donations, it, it causes a nice, healthy, competitive environment on LinkedIn. Um, so 
that's something that I, I, I think is a nice thing to do is thank your sponsors on LinkedIn and use that as a way to generate more appeals. Excellent. Yeah. LinkedIn's super powerful and I think always releasing new features to make it easier to target uh, the individuals that you want to target. So thank you. Yeah. For that. And there is That's also, I'm going to do yeah. one plug for LinkedIn. They do also have uh, LinkedIn not like for nonprofits. Um, so take a look That's at right. that and see how your nonprofit might be able to utilize some of the features. Um, I don't believe they have an actual direct fundraising feature, but they have a lot of resources available to nonprofits that make the opportunity to be present on those platforms a little bit um, uh, more optimized for you guys. That's right. Excellent. Excellent. Well, final takeaways, last things that you want to make sure that attendees walk away with maybe one top thing that they bring into their end of year fundraising. Okay. Oh, that's a good question. I think it's, I think it's really getting, spending the time to get a plan together and, and executing against your plan and, and knowing what your goals are and, and not trying to do a million things. Um, it's, it's, you know, there, there's a lot of money to be made in this last, the last quarter or what's left of it. Um, and people, you know, a lot of these corporations didn't spend money because their marketing budgets got cut. So from corporate mm -hmm. funding, I, I think there's money out there. It's just really focusing on, on who you want to go after and, and, and trying to use all these tools to, to get there. Yeah, and I would say um, in conjunction with that is start now, right? Um, don't let the year go by without doing anything. Be realistic with your goals, um, but also mm -hmm. be intentional with your goals. But don't lose the opportunity over the next seven weeks to really um, harness your, uh, your opportunity to make a little bit extra money for your year end fundraising efforts. So get it started as soon as you can, uh, but do it with a lot of intention and planning. Some wise words to leave us with Joe and Wit. Thank you so much for being with us again. We always appreciate having the tap team here, sharing your knowledge. Thank you for having us, Nicole. And we'll just wrap with these upcoming events that we have coming from TechSoup. Um, so next week we have one on cyber attacks on the rise, making sure that your nonprofit is prepared. Then we have one all about pastor payroll and making sure that you understand um, some things around uh, uh, QuickBooks for your faith-based organization. And then we have one on apps that address food insecurity with some really great demos and to feel inspired and to also think about some of your own solutions for your community. So check out these upcoming events. You can head on over to techsoup.org slash community dash events. And with that, thank you again for being with us. Please make sure you take our survey on your way out. Um, you'll actually be prompted once you exit Zoom. And I've also included it in the chat. Once again, we'll send you a replay a recording and all the links and how to get in touch with TAP um, and make sure that they are at your disposal. So thank you again, be well, stay safe, and we will see you around. Bye everyone.